All right, so happy Mother's Day to all the moms. And so uh, you can just applaud for them for a moment. I think it's, it's the right thing to do. All right, so we are really, really privileged today. And uh, you've heard me talk numerous times about my Michigan daughter. And, uh, and so people have come up and said, well, who in the world is your Michigan daughter? Well, today you actually get to meet her. Uh, and her name is Erin Rowling. Yeah, you can hoot for her a little bit. She's great. So Erin came and lived with us uh, while her mom was on the mission field. And so she really became part of our family. I had the privilege of actually walking her down the aisle when she got married. And uh, I can tell you that she's one of the sweetest, kindest, most honest, has an incredible integrity of any person I've ever met in my life. And uh, her and Paul have pioneered a church now in Marlette, Michigan, uh, about two years ago, and the church is already up to about 250 people. They're running three services. I mean, and you have to realize this. Go ahead and clap for that. <clears throat> and you have to realize this is not like uh, some church that has a big town around it. It's like in the middle of Nothingville. And uh, so for, for that to be happening in, in that area of Michigan is really astounding. And uh, I think it speaks to their giftings and, that, and their love for God. And so with that, I want to uh, have Aaron come. And um, what do you say when you have somebody come forward? With that, anyways, Aaron will come, and she's going to speak to us. I'm just going to forewarn you, I have my tissues with me. Um, it seemed, and then I lost one. Um, it seems like whenever I go to speak, I cry. So don't be, you know, scared. It just happens. My friend just told me, don't snot into the microphone. Try not to do that, because I have done that before. So, um, but happy Mother's Day to all of you moms. I I'm a mom of four, very blessed, um, Amanda, Elizabeth, Joseph, and Abigail. And um, my da daughter, who's five, we traveled from Michigan yesterday, and she brought her whole little knapsack filled with Mother's Day cards, and I guarantee it will say three things. It will say, Mom, October, Abigail Rowling. October being because that's the first word she learned how to spell. So it doesn't really mean anything. It's just her way of spelling October with a backward Z, but um, anyways, I'm, I feel very honored to be here this morning, and just this is our home away from home. Many of you may not know us, but we have been traveling here for 17 years to see the Gilchrist, and um, every time we come, we're inspired, we're filled up, we're encouraged, we're strengthened, um, and it's been amazing to watch what God has done in this place over the last 17 years and really encouraged us. And this church has been a huge part of what we've been able to do in Marlette, our little town, because they've really just encouraged us to go out and do it. I remember when my husband called Brother Kirk and said, well, I feel like maybe we should plant a church, hoping that maybe he would say, "Nah, I don't think that's a good idea. And that wasn't his response. His response was, I think that's great. You should do it. So we're like, okay, <laughs> I guess we should go do that. But, um, I just, uh, you have some of the most amazing people in the world spearheading what God is doing here. And I am incredibly privileged to know Brother Kirk as a father figure in my life, as a spiritual father. Um, Shirley is one of the wisest men I have, is the wisest man that I know. And um, just the only time that I was scared of him is when he would say, Aaron, front room, let's talk. <laughs> And I'd be like, uh-oh, what did I do now? So he has poured countless hours of love, but encouragement, some chastisement in there, and helped me become the person that I am today. Carolyn is a whole lot of things wrapped up in one. She is a second mom, a best friend, a sister, just a confident, and um, I love her with everything within me. It's hard being far from her. In our house, we have a saying, when we don't know what to do, my husband and I look at each other and we say, call Carolyn, she'll know what to do. Um, Christopher and Jennifer, Christopher wrecks me every time. So if you don't want to be wrecked, don't talk to him, stay away from him. God has used him countless times to just speak the word of the Lord to, to me and rise up a lot of dry bones in myself. 
And Jennifer, I love her. Um, I just like to look at her. I don't know if that's right or wrong. I know they have man crushes. I have a slight woman crush on her. Um, and she never takes a bad selfie, so I don't know what's up with that. But these are the people who God has called to um, bring his vision to this place. And I know, and I'm just inspired by watching all the people who it takes to make this work. And having a church of our own, I know the countless hours that go into it and the attack that goes into it. And just, you guys are amazing. You're doing an amazing job. And I feel blessed to have a small part in what's going on here. Today I feel to share my testimony with you. And I can honestly say that most of my life, I felt like I didn't have a testimony. When Paul and I would be together, people would say to him, so how did you get saved? And he'd be like, I was 18, and I was on drugs, and I was al had alcohol, and I was swearing. I woke up the next morning, and I was a completely new man. And then there was me, and they'd say, how did you get saved? And I'd think, could I say that I killed people? Would that sound good? Like, I killed people, and then God saved me. And I'm new. And uh, because, really, I got saved when I was three. What are you going to say? You know, I got saved when I was three. Isn't that exciting? And people will be like, yeah, that's nice. So <laughs> most of my life I thought, okay, there's not a whole lot here to share. And then a pastor friend of ours had us over for dinner, and he started asking me questions, and I started sharing my life. And at the end of it, he said, wow, what a testimony. And that was the first time that I realized that a testimony is not just the moment that you find Jesus, even though that is the single most important decision we will ever make in our life. But it really is about the story. And so today I'm just going to share my story with you. Um, if there was one word that sums up um, my mom and dad finding out that I was coming, it would be unwanted. Um, I'm just like trying to figure out how long it's going to take till I cry. That's <laughs> Maybe by fourth service I'll be good. But um, they, my mom was married on her second marriage, already had a kid, but had met a guy at a party and started an affair with him, and I was the product of that affair. So when she went to tell him that she was pregnant, him and his family, their response was, have an abortion. And so he said, you know, you can choose to do what you want, but I strongly, I want nothing to do with the baby. You need to have an abortion, and he moved on. And my mom, um, she went to Planned Parenthood, and she had a huge decision to make on that day. And today I thank her for choosing life. I will forever be grateful that she chose that. But that didn't come without consequences for her. She found, I was born on December 16th at 12.01 on her and her husband's anniversary. So happy anniversary, have a baby, it's not even yours. So she found herself divorced, alone with two kids. She moved to Michigan. We were in Missouri at the time and um, Went to live with my grandma, which she lived in Detroit, and she lived in Cass Corridor, which if you're not from Michigan, you may not know, but Cass Corridor is about the worst part of Detroit. We weren't allow allowed outside of the house without um, my pops, who was my grandpa, taking us outside. And then we were told never to look at anybody, to keep our eyes down. And so it wasn't a safe place to live at all. And my mom needed to work, so she... My grandma said she'd take care of us, and my sister's seven years older, so she was off at school. My mom's friend came and lived there. She was a single mom, so me and my friend Greg were kind of left with my grandma. Well, she had some very not great ideas of taking care of children, so she would take us in a room and lock us in a room for hours, which I know when you're younger, it feels like eternity. But I remember knocking us knocking on the door, and asking her to let us out so we could go to the bathroom, and she wouldn't answer the door. And I remember a big barrel in the room, and we'd stuff it all with our toys, and we'd take them out, and we'd stuff it back. 
We'd ask to get out, and she'd never open the door until she felt it was time. I remember trying to, um, when it was nap time, you want your mom. And so I'd stand at the top of the staircase, and I'd call out, Mom, to see if she was home yet. And uh, my grandma's way of dealing with that is she took belts, and she um, buckled them together and strapped me to the bed because that was a way for me not to get up. And her way of doing if we were really bad was um, we had a basement. And I remember my mom did not go into that basement without a baseball bat because of the rats. And she said, you know, if, if one came after her, she'd be able to get it. And so my grandma would take a chair, and she'd set it down on the basement floor, and she'd sit us there, and she'd turn off the lights, and she'd lock the door. I remember feeling the rats. And I remember thinking, if I can make it to the staircase, I won't feel them. Those weren't great years. But eventually, my mom was able to move out of that situation. And um, we lived in housing where it was based on your income. And uh, we were poor. I mean, my kids think sometimes we're poor, but we're not poor. I know what it is to be poor. And uh, we had like one of those bug cars that never started, had no heat. We would take blankets out, and we'd get in the car, and it wouldn't start. She'd like, get out, lay hands on it. We got to do some praying, get this baby started. And we'd get out, we'd lay hands on it, and it would start, and we'd go off our merry little way. There were times we didn't have food, and she'd say, girls, I can't, I can't buy the food, so we need to pray. But we need to ask the Lord to provide for us. Now, my kids think when there's no food, there's no food. But I look in the cupboard, and I see lots of food. It's just food that they don't want to eat. But when we used to open the cupboard, there wasn't anything. I remember opening them and not seeing one can of food. But God provided. And I remember she worked at a, a food factory, and they got extra food. And she'd come home, and she'd say, see, girls, God answered our prayers. And then someone would drop by with two bags of groceries, and she'd say, your heavenly Father is providing for you. And then my grandma made us some egg salad sandwiches, which I'm sure it was like seven grain bread, but it felt like 30 grain bread. And uh, she made a lot of them, so she stuck them in the freezer. My mom would forget to take them out of the freezer. So it was dinner time. That doesn't taste good. I cannot look at an egg salad sandwich to this day because they're so nasty. <laughs> So, but we learned from an early age that God was our provider. When we didn't have clothes, you know how you have those little growth spurts? It seems like everything fits one day, the next nothing fits. She'd say, you need to go ask your Heavenly Father to provide for you. So I'd go in my room, I'd get on my knees, I'd say, Lord, I have no clothes. And then the next day, someone would be like, hey, I was cleaning out my daughter's closet, wondered if you needed clothes. And my mom would say, God provided for you. Not only did my mom choose life, but she also gave me the second best gift in the world, and that was showing me who Jesus was. I experienced my Heavenly Father in a huge way because I couldn't live without him. We couldn't eat without him. We weren't clothed without him. So we needed him. He was very, very real to me at a very young age. With not having a dad in my life, when you're little, you want to know about him. I remember asking my mom, what does he look like? Do I look like him? My mom and sister were messy. Was he clean like me? Did he like to organize his drawers after school like I did? Did he, like, what was about him that was like me? I needed to see somebody who was me. And a lot of things my mom was, we weren't really, so I was like, well, what's he like? And so you begin to have this thought process of what does he look like and all these things about him. So I'd ask her and she'd say, why do you want to know about him? He didn't want you. So why do you want to know about somebody who didn't want you? Can I tell you for a little girl's heart? It breaks. And the questions begin to come, what about me? 
is not lovely. What about me is not special? That he wouldn't want me. Maybe if he met me, he would. I remember wanting to see my baby book. And my mom said we didn't have one, and then she found one. And I was so excited. And I opened it. And besides it saying Aaron Michelle and, you know, the doctor's name and the weight and all that stuff, it had one sentence in it. And it said, how does baby eat? And she wrote, considered pig. And I said, why would you write that? And she said, because you were so fat, I had to put you on a diet. You're the fattest baby I ever saw. And my heart broke. And the insecurities rose up. And I suffered for years having value. Because I, I was fat. I wasn't worthy of love. We went to Africa and lived there for a couple years. Some of the greatest years of my life had experiences that I loved. I told my mom she was super lucky or blessed to have a teenager who didn't do anything because there wasn't anything to do. So I'm trying to convince my husband, let's move somewhere where our kids have nothing to do. That hasn't gone over real well. But... um, At that time, I was going to come back and live with Brother Kirk and Carolyn, who I had formed a relationship with when I was seven years old. And Brother Kirk really took that seriously of becoming that father figure to me and speaking into my life. And so I was excited. I got to come live with them. I got to experience a family, a mom and a dad and kids, and just get to be in that environment and at the airport, my mom, you know, said, right as I was about to um, board the plane, she said, well, I've done my job, and I'm done. So now I'm sending you to Kirk and Carolyn, and they can take care of you now. I'm a mom, and I can tell you I am never done. I will be their mom until I take my last breath. I don't care where I am, what I am doing. They are my life. And so for me, again, it spoke, you're not worthy. You are discardable. They may love you for a time, but there will come a day that you're not worth it anymore. It's like an, it's a long trip home from Africa, and I sobbed most of the way. Because I thought, again, what about me? It's so discardable. What about me? It's so unlovely that you could so easily give me up. I went on to have a a tremendous opportunity to live with some of the greatest people that I know. And they poured continuous love into me. And um, I met my husband. We got married. We've had kids. And um, if you would have asked me, Did you feel resentment or anger towards God about not having the dad in your life? I would have said no. I've forgiven him. I did end up meeting my dad when I was 17. Um, We're working on building a relationship. Um, And as he gets older, he gets softer. And we've had a chance to cry it out and go through the process of the healing. But... I never knew what was in the deepest part of my heart. And we had come here to visit, and I think it was about here when I'm looking at the stage, but Brother Kirk had um, 
offered an altar call, and I can't remember what you preached on, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I just remember him saying an altar call, and there's been many times where at the altar I've, I've just met with Jesus, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to come down, and I'm going to meet with Jesus, and it'll be great, and so I got down here, and, uh, you know, just praying and being quiet, and all of a sudden, I don't know where it came from, but out of the very deepest part of my core, the deepest place of my heart, and a place that obviously had been hidden, there came a cry. And if I had done it out loud, you all would have stopped and just stared at me because it was at the top of my lungs, in myself, and of my being, I yelled out, why didn't you give me the dad that I always wanted? Why couldn't you give me that? And then I thought, he's going to kill me. I'm dead. Step back, people. The lightning's going to come. Did you know you can have it out with God? Because this is the God that I know and I experienced. Instead of saying, why on earth would you question me? Don't you just trust me? Don't you just trust the plan? No. He spoke to my heart in the most tender of ways. It was almost like he just scooped me up in his arms. And he said, then you wouldn't have known me the way that you know me. And so I said, then it's worth it. It's worth it, Jesus. And then I just bowed down in repentance for holding that grudge against him and began to thank him from the deepest place of my heart that I had the opportunity to know him in that way. That he had given me the chance to know him as my heavenly father. Because see, he cared for that little girl in the basement. He was there. I don't actually remember being really scared. He was there. He heard the cries of a little girl as she cried in her bed, broken, as she watched dads and their daughters bond and do things. He was there. So I thought I was good. But you know God, he has a way of telling us, well, we got a few other things we need to take care of. And so um, I was watching online. Someone had posted something online from here when you guys had done cardboard testimonies. And I thought, that's great. I think we should do that. So I told our, our pastor, I said, check it out. I think we should do it. And uh, so um, he checked it out. He goes, I think it's great. Let's do it. And then he called me, and he said, Aaron, I think you should do it. And I said, no, I gave you the idea. I didn't say I was going to do it. And I said, well, how about if someone bails out, then I'll do it. And he's like, no, you're supposed to do it. So I was making dinner, and um, I have some very real conversations with God. And so I was telling him, I just don't think that's right. What do you want me to write? Saved at three. Turn it over. Hallelujah. That's exciting. When everybody else has got, I did crack cocaine. I killed people. I did this, you know. I'm like, that doesn't even compare, God. How can I even, like, please, let me get sick. Let me, you know, something happen. And so I was telling him all my little thoughts. And uh, all of a sudden, he kind of stopped me in my tracks. And he said, this is what you're going to write.
And I thought, fearfully and wonderfully made. Where have I heard that? Or I'm like, okay, I know it's in the Bible. So I ran to my Bible and I found in Psalm 139. Starting in verse 13, it says, For you created my innermost beings. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And I started dancing around the kitchen saying, I was wanted, I was wanted. I went from unwanted to fearfully and wonderfully made. See, the two people who should have wanted me the most didn't. But there's a God in heaven who saw my unformed body, and he said, I'm going to create this girl, Erin Michelle, because I have plans. I have a purpose for her, because one day she's going to go through all this stuff in her life, all these chapters, but I have a purpose and a plan, because one day I'm going to call her and her husband to a place called Marlette that's in the thumb of Michigan, A place that everyone says nothing good can come out of. A place that people want to leave. They don't move there. They move away. It's depressed. But I'm going to bring hope. And Hope Community Christian Church was planted. He had a purpose. He had a plan. So if you're here today and you resonate with not feeling wanted... I can tell you with all assurance that you were wanted, that God ordained every single one of your days before you were even formed. That's our God, people. That's the God that we serve. And can I just say this? So often, we take our, the enemy tells us all the things that we're not. And this is what we do. We put our hand right back around him, and we start agreeing with what he's saying. But the Bible says that Satan comes to kill, destroy, and rob. (laughs) But this is the exciting part. Jesus comes on the scene, people. He says, but I come. Hey, the victor comes. He comes triumphantly like we sing that song. The knight in shining armor comes, people. He comes to save the the day. He says, I come that you might have life and life more abundantly. Amen? Some of you are like, that was not a Mother's Day message. That was not a feel-good message. But I pray that you know Jesus' love, and if you don't today, that you find a place with him where you can just let him scoop you up and just speak his love over you. I want to say to all the moms out there, whether you've naturally birthed children, whether you're a spiritual mom, or if you're going to be a mom, young ladies, when you become a mom, that you are beautiful. The world may tell us otherwise, but there is a father up above who is looking down in an incredible amount of love to you. And I pray that this song blesses you. Happy Mother's Day. her own reflection twirl around stare it down what's the mirror gonna say with some luck 
No measure up, but you might not hold a candle to the rest. Is that your best? Says the mirror to the mess. But there's a whisper in the night. Can you hear the little voice? And he says, Has anybody told you you're beautiful? You might agree. Could see what I see. Oh, cause everything about you is incredible. You should have seen me smile the day that I made you beautiful for me. If it's true, beauty lies in the eye of the beholder. Want my life, what's inside, to give him something to be home. I want a heart that's captivating. I want to hear my father say. You're beautiful You might agree if you could see what I see Whoa Cause everything about you is incredible You should have seen me smile the day that I made you beautiful Close your eyes Look inside Let me see the you that you've been trying to hide Long ago I made you so very beautiful So I gotta know you're beautiful Has anybody told you you're beautiful You might agree if you could see what I see Yeah Cause everything about you is incredible You should have seen me smile the day that I made you beautiful You're so beautiful told you yeah. Amen. <clears throat> you know, I just want to say, um, so proud of my wife. Uh, she is one amazing woman, and uh, I'm so blessed to have her as my wife. You know, just to wrap up too, uh, as I was thinking about what my wife shared, that, that we were knit together in our mother's womb. You know, when you think about the Lord, he's the great creator, right? He said, let there be light, there was light. You know, let there be planets, let there be vegetation. He just spoke it, and there it is. But then the Bible says, but he knit us together in our mother's womb. It wasn't like an assembly line. He's just making humans. You know, he's, he's taking his time. Knit together. The way you would look how tall you would be, the color of your eyes, you know, just everything wonderfully, fearfully made, perfect. And he doesn't make mistakes, you know. And, and I just want to say, so often the enemy, like my wife said so, so beautifully, you know, he'll lie to you and convince you that you're a mistake or that you're not good enough and, and try to give you reasons to be insecure. You know, I, I'm, I don't look as good as everybody else or I, I'm not, a, you know, like, like the others, but you're just perfect. And God has such a beautiful and awesome plan for you. There's, he doesn't make mistakes. Where you were born, the era you were born in, your personality, all of it. The fact that my wife cries through a message. It's who God made her. He gave her this tender heart like, like nobody I've ever met. So I just want to do something to wrap up here if we could. 
if you would, I just don't want anybody to leave here without missing an opportunity. I'm not going to call you up. I'm not going to draw you out. But what I do want to ask you, just, just close your eyes in this room at this moment. And, and I want, if, if you're here and you thought, you know what, that was for me. I, I have wrestled with insecurity. I've, I've felt like I'm not good enough. I don't measure up. But today I want to declare that I am wonderfully and fearfully made, that God didn't make a mistake with me. And you want to just receive that and walk out of here a new person, writing a new chapter in your life. I want to give you just, just to walk out being free in that area. I just want to pray with you. You're not going to come up, but I want you to raise your hand and say, I needed to hear that. And I want to be able to pray with you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I see those hands. And I'd like to just pray a blessing over you as we send you out today. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, for, for what the work you've done in my wife and the testimony. And Lord, as I look around this room and I see the hands up, Lord God, Lord, I just pray this morning that we would walk out of here free knowing that we are created just the way we are and that our God doesn't make mistakes. And Lord, I just pray we'd walk out of here with a freedom, that it's a new day with new chapters to be written and that you don't make mistakes and that we are perfect in your sight, Lord. And I just pray that let those who raised their hand would just walk out of here with a new victory and they would be all the things that God has created them to be. Thank you, God. We love you. Thanks for a new work that you're doing today. We receive it in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Happy Mother's Day. We love you, mamas. Have a great day.